Thank you very much. And in fact, my talk goes on really quite naturally from Sue Bailey's, which I thought was absolutely superb. And uh, though we've only <laughs> compared a few notes, my theme will, will follow. And then, funny enough, Sue and I will join up again because I'm taking Sue to the Royal College of GPs, where she's going to get the highest honour that the Royal College of GPs can bestow on anybody, which is our honorary fellowship. So if she does come back, you might want to congratulate her. Now, as well as being a GP, as my darling husband has told you, I used to be a psychiatrist, and I now have the privilege of combining those two roles. And I run the only practitioner health program service in England funded by the NHS. And though my talk is predominantly about the NHS, it is actually generalizable to whichever profession any of you are at, and including the voluntary sector, which is in fact you know, part of the public service, it's just in a different part. So forgive me for focusing on the NHS and forgive me for focusing predominantly on doctors, but as I said, it is generalizable and you will recognize the themes as we go through. So I have been running a practitioner health service and this is for <coughs> doctors and dentists with mental health and addiction problems who work, uh, who live in the London area. We've seen now about 1,500 doctors and dentists over the last eight years. The numbers coming to us has risen from when we opened the doors for three a week, and our record was just a couple of weeks ago when we had 30 new referrals. If you build it, they will come. And what we've seen over the years is a fairly stable picture of those that have mental health versus addiction. It tends to be a third are addiction, two thirds mental health. And even in those categories, we've seen a fairly stable split. So a third of the addiction, two-thirds have alcohol, and a third have drugs. And in the mental health, around two-thirds have anxiety, depression, uh, eating disorder, and the remaining third have psychosis or, or some sort of complex uh, mental health issue. So those have stayed more or less the same. But what hasn't changed, or what has changed, isn't just the numbers coming to see us, but the demographics of those coming to see us. When we opened our doors, the predominant group that were coming to see us were older male GPs with predominantly alcohol problems. We are now seeing a five-fold increase in the number of younger doctors, in particular younger women, coming to see us. And the peak age, the mode age of our service, is sadly 29 to 30. So within years, just a few years of qualification, what we're doing, as Sue Bailey described, is taking these idealistic, fantastic young people and putting them into what I have now described as the toxic environment of the NHS. And it is this toxic environment that I think is making people sick. And I want to talk about that at the moment. The NHS has been described as one of the most astonishing endeavours of human times. And you heard about Intelligent Kindness. That book, by the way, saved my life when I was chair of council. It is the book that I was able to pick up in the mess that I was exposed to around the Health and Social Care Act, and it made sense. So if you haven't already read it, I urge you. But what they say is that the NHS is an embodiment of kinship and the last vestige of social inclusiveness. You know that Nigel Lawson described the NHS as the nearest thing that we, the English, have to a national religion. And that is because we have faith, he didn't say this, I'm saying this, because we have faith in it being there when we need it. For 70 years, it's been the central feature of our lives. And I think it's been our link with a nostalgic past and those who founded it for us and actually our nostalgic link with the dying embers of the Second World War. Now, though Ballot and Campling do give us this idolised version of the NHS as this group embodying kinship and community, in reality, as many in this room know, and as I know looking after sick doctors, it is far from that. And to paraphrase Tony Judd, and any of you who haven't read his book, he wrote a book, Something is Profoundly Wrong with the Way We Live Today. And I have paraphrased that and written a paper called There's Something Profoundly Wrong with the NHS Today. And you must bear in mind that I am passionate about the NHS. 
The NHS is becoming a place, an environment, where staff feel attacked, unloved and abandoned by their political and managerial leaders. And there is a prevailing <coughs> mood of fear that is around, juxtaposed against the culture of kindness and compassion that we're meant to espouse. As the Francis report has told us, and as every day, and as Sue mentioned, we now have a competency framework on this. One in four NHS staff now report to being bullied in the last 12 months, much higher than anywhere else in employment, and the rate has doubled over the last four years. For doctors and nurses, high rates of mental illness, emigration, whistleblowing, <laughs> suspensions, referral to the regulator, and complaints all point to a system that is in serious trouble. I would say that though all staff are suffering, and I suspect some in this room are, I think my profession, that's general practitioners, seem to be affected most. And we've now jumped over nurses who were vilified the most into us that are vilified the most. And this is taking its toll. Only 20% of qualifying doctors now enter my profession. We have high dropout rates and high rates of mental illness. And we have many unfilled training posts. Every day, GPs are now being blamed for the failings in the NHS. Which, by the by, I predicted way back when, in 2010, when we were handed the po poison chalice of leading the health and social care reforms through CCGs. Just need to put it on silent, uh, Rex. If you want, I can show you how to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to take him from a, a tutorial in IT, but he's an analyst, and analysts don't understand that. Anyway, the causes of distress, what are... Now, you've already heard from Sue some of the causes of this, the, the distress, but I'd like to say there are two main causes of distress that we're seeing. The first is the industrialisation of healthcare. And over the years, we've seen the NHS shift from a utilitarian set of values to a market mentality. The inexorable move from a nationally state-funded, state-owned, state-managed organisation to a fragmented system of multiple competing providers, outsourced management and increasingly mixed funding, I would say sits badly with those of us who entered what is in a sense a public service and the ethos that we bring with that as public service employees. The drive for privatisation is destroying the whole of the welfare state, not just the health service. And according to Bauman, a, a great uh, sociologist, he said the gradual but consistent accelerated withdrawal of the communal, i.e. the state, insurance system against individual and failure and ill fortune is leaving individuals to fend for themselves in an increasingly uncertain and unpredictable world. And how true is that for all the patients, clients, individuals that we see? It is their fault if they become homeless, poor, mentally ill, or a recipient of all uh, the degrees of, of malfunction and malfortune that we see. The effects of this process are described by Ilif in his book, The Industrialization of Medicine, as creating widespread, widespread anxiety, affecting both users and carers. And it's actually turning medicine away from a craft concerned with the uniqueness of every encounter with an ill person into mass manufacturing industry preoccupied with the throughput of the sick. I don't know how many of you work in IAPS, but certainly IAPS now is becoming industrialization of CBT with a throughput that's more concerned about numbers. I'm not saying that's because of yourselves, I think you're highly skilled practitioners, but the system around you is making you behave like that. Iona Heath, who was our immediate past president of the Royal College of GPs, described the commercialisation of general practice as the dark forces of work behind the subversion of professionalism. Now, the second major cause of distress, many of you will recognise this, is constant change, which reduces both the individual and the organisation's ability to function. Moving house, by the way, 
is the most stressful life event, more stressful than divorce, more stressful than death in one's loved one, more stressful than imprisonment. And yet the NHS has moved house every two to three years as long as I've remembered. Nurses, doctors, managers, administrators, patients all want stability, security and safety. But instead the NHS and education is in a st constant state of permanent transition. Paradoxically, trying to fix something that's working well. Each attempt to fashion a new order produces a new disorder. The NHS is in constant flux of uncertainty and rapidly changing social and power positions. Ray Tallis, in his book, The Hippocratic Oath, which I again urge you all to read, asserts that successive disorganisations have reduced the influence of the medical profession and with it the progressive marginalisation of the role of doctors <coughs> in the process of shaping the service in which they work. <coughs> now, of course organisations can and will adapt to change. Of course we do. We're not Luddites. And we use social resilience to allow us to do that. But if the changes are so big and so vast, then actually it becomes very difficult to adapt. And what happens is a threshold may be reached where the system then is un undergoes a fundamental shift and risks the health of its more vulnerable members in its wake. And this is what the NHS has been exposed to, seismic shifts over the last 20 years. Especially so the last one in 2012, which was the then chief executive of the NHS, David Nicholson, said it was so large you could see it from outer space. And I think the NHS has actually reached its, or gone beyond its elastic limit. Now what can we do and how can we understand this? So there's these two forces, the industrialisation and the constant change. Now I, over the last year since giving up office as the chair of the college, have been trying to understand why the environment I love and have worked in for the last nearly 40 years is causing so much distress. And what I've started to look at is the literature around group analysis and group therapy, which is where Rex and I met. Now the literature from group therapy can start to help us understand the destructive forces that is going on in the NHS. Like the NHS, group therapy had its origins in the Second World War when two th therapists, Bion and Fuchs, developed the idea of treating injured soldiers in groups, sharing their experiences together. An invisible matrix, a network of relationships and projections, connects groups and in times of distress can push them apart. The NHS functions not as a single group, of course it's too vast for that, but as groups within groups, a web <coughs> of interdependent systems. And group members, us, the staff that work within it, are invisibly connected by a matrix that is formed through historical and cultural links, and by a social solidarity and shared experiences built up over generations of patients and staff. Gerhard Wilkes, who was an anthropologist who became a group analyst, said that an organisation, an environment, the groups we work in can, in different circumstances, make us safe by becoming a carer substitute for us or can threaten our integrity by making demands that we feel exceed our inner resource. And he believes the NHS as an environment is no longer a good enough environmental mother but has turned into a neglectful and persecuting parent. And clinicians now feel like naughty children and managers as enforcers of utopian, utopian visions generated by out-of-touch politicians. Groups can have a positive therapeutic effect, but as I said, in times of distress, can be destructive. Another group analyst called Morris Nitson uh, developed the, the term the anti-group, where he described these destructive forces. And he too, had the two main causes of the destructive forces that happened, which started to resonate with me 
as I try to understand my dilemma about what I loved most being so damaging. So he described forces having several, several uh, places. The first force is the failure to create an empathic environment for staff, which we know the NHS doesn't pr produce an empathic environment. And the paradox of values that we, the staff in this room, care for patients, but they, our employers, do not care for us. And this gives rise to profound bitterness. And we heard in that little exercise of the good and the bad, the good was around being cared for, being respected. Very little about terms and conditions. It was about feelings and values. Nitzan also talks about another destructive force causing the anti-group, and that is the fear felt of shame and humiliation. Policies now deliberately designed to name and shame. NHS choices, friends and family test, I don't know whether the outside the health service you have to, po you have to uh, face these, but these encourage anonymous comments from clinicians, managers, hospitals, whatever, online. Anonymous, nasty comments, which unless they're libelous, you <coughs> cannot remove, and we have tried to remove them. The second, I think, is the new CQC inspection regime. Yesterday, two days ago, my practice was inspected. It was inspected on the day that the Daily Mail published uh, the CQC's uh, league table. So we were inspected on the day that the CQC published their league table. How odd is that? Where the Hurley, where I worked, was bottom of the list, or one of the bottom, the number one. One to six, six is top one. You can imagine how my staff felt as we tried to show the CQC inspector that CQC is not measuring us on how many patients we have through the violent patient schemes, on how many patients we manage who have been raped by their carers, or how many drug-related issues we deal with, and the kindness and compassion that we show our patients through that. No, CQC were judging us on the metrics of the number of frail elderly admitted to hospital, as if that I can change, like King Canute changing the tide. Or the number of patients that I diagnose with dementia. Bear in mind, ladies and gentlemen, we are now going to be funded and performance managed to diagnose dementia, and now we are targeted through our CQC on the numbers. Imagine what that might do to you when I diagnose your mother with dementia. Am I doing it so I'm not humiliated with a CQC number one? <laughs> Am I doing it to earn 55 pounds, or am I doing it because actually I care for your mother? So yesterday we had the CQC. The new inspection re regime is already creating fear in those being inspected, and name, blame, shame policies means that doctors face humiliation for any transgression, even if that transgression is being an understandable outlier in performance or refusing to participate in the process. The policy is already having its desired effects. This was last year, three surgeons, I don't know whether any of you remembered, were deemed to be the bottom of the league table in respect, uh, of all the surgeons. And actually their, their pictures were grainy photos in the Daily Mail, hinting, with their name, hinting at criminal intent. In fact, each surgeon, it was a coding error or because they didn't actually do many operations, so they, it was a, a statistical quirk, but the damage was done. On a daily basis, the NHS is exposed to negative stories, with us being accused of being cruel and uncaring. Doctors, nurses and managers are seen as villains and berated by journalists who conveniently forget that the NHS tops the list of what the public feel proud of. The barrage of negative stories corrodes trust, saps morale and creates defensiveness and ignores the good work done by the vast majority of staff in the NHS uh, or that the NHS delivers in monetary term vastly superior services to most comparable health services. So saying all that then ladies and gentlemen, what can we do about it? Because that's a pretty negative talk I've just given you. As I said, since demitting office, I've pledged to turn this juggernaut of poor empathy, whatever the opposite of poor empathy, and fear around, because we cannot continue to work in this sort of environment. 
Sue mentioned the NICE recommendations. It's not just NICE, there have been 86 recommendations made by earnest bodies over the last eight years. And if any of you want them, I've mapped them out in part of my anal state. <laughs> recommendations that talk about what managers should do, what staff should do, uh, what, what HR should do, but not one of those recommendations is about what our politicians should do. I have now, since last year, been working with Rex, the Royal College of Psychiatrists and the Institute of Group Analysis. And we have started to host a series of listening events. We formed an organisation called the Founders Network. We've called it that only because it was, had its first meeting in a room called the Founders Room. How original can you get? The organisation includes Penelope Campling and in view, includes many others who are working towards creating an empathic NHS. The Founders Group, as I said, has, uh, is beginning to, to host a number of listening events so that we can hear from those that work in the NHS or around the NHS what it's like for them. The second limb of the Founders Network is actually as a lobbying, a lobbying group. And what we're going to do is to gather the voices of those who have come to our events, and we've held two or three up till now, and the next one is September, uh, 24th of January, and the flyers are outside. The last one is the 24th of January. And after that, we're going to host an event here, a closed event, with politicians, policy makers, and senior practitioners. And those of us who have been listening will be telling those who should hear what is going on in the environment that we all work in. We're hoping, and though there's no magic to this, but we are hoping that those who come to listen to what we've been hearing will actually take away and will start to put in <coughs> policies and practices or remove policies of practices to create an empathic NHS. Because if we don't, our patients, our clients, whatever we call them, will begin to suffer because it is impossible on a daily basis to be compassionate when we ourselves feel anything, feel far from compassionate. And what I tell people is that while competence to act and competence to do our job is the last thing that goes when we're stressed, the first thing that goes is compassion. So if you come and if you will come and help us on this journey, we'll be terribly grateful. All the events are free. Everybody giving their time up in the events uh, get, don't get paid. All the venues are free, being donated to us. And we hope that we can start to enable the environment of the NHS to itself be more compassionate. Thank you very much. <laughs>